revelation of Jesus Christ and uh, the revealing or the unveiling of Jesus Christ by reading the book of Revelation we can get to know the Lord Jesus Christ a little bit better actually a lot better and uh, we can be blessed and praise God that uh, God gave us this wonderful book and we're going to start by reading Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 then we're going to skip ahead and look at verse number 11 we'll read three verses and then we'll get into the sermon if you'll stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Then we'll skip ahead to verse number 11 and we'll read them all together in unison, starting in verse number 1. Ready? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now stop right there. Oh, this is the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And it was given to his servant John. John, who bear record of the word of God. Remember John, the book of John, the gospel of John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Uh, Jesus is the Word. Verse 4, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so he bare record of the Word of God. He lived and saw the Lord Jesus Christ. He walked with Jesus Christ. He talked with Jesus Christ. He was instructed by Christ. He was there when uh, Jesus ascended up on the Mount of Olives into heaven. He was there when he gave him the gospel to go. And, and he bare record of that. That's wonderful. And the testimony of all that he saw. Now go to verse number 11. And if you will, let's read this together. Ready? saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And praise the Lord. Look at verse number 19. Now we'll add one more verse, verse number 19. By the way, those seven churches... Uh, were given a letter, and chapters 2 and 3 give us seven little letters or little uh, instruction packets, you might say, for each of the churches right there. And uh, now look at verse number 19. Let's read this together. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The things which are. Chapter 1 is the things which are. And then praise the Lord. The, uh, write the things which thou hast, hast seen. The things which have seen is chapter 1. I'm sorry. The things which are chapter 2 and 3. And chapter 4 to the end is future. So it's a basic outline of the book of Revelation. We went over that last week. This evening I'm going to be preaching on the seven churches. Seven churches, seven truths. We're going to look at those seven churches and look at seven church truths. By the way, truths that were given to the church, not a building, but people. And that's important. We're a church. These seven truths in these seven churches can actually help you and I, and I believe they will. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I love you. It feels like, Lord, I am on gear number five. In some ways, I ask that you would help me to slow down, speak clearly. And I get excited about your word. I've been excited about church all day long, Lord. I'm just excited about being around your people, Lord. God, I pray that tonight that we're able to look at these two chapters, these seven churches, these seven truths, make some application to our life, and as a church, be bettered and strengthened with uh, these truths, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, back by popular demand. Back by popular demand is a map. And I uh, know last week you were struggling because the pastor did not draw you a map. And so the pastor will draw you a map. Amen. <laughs> oh. oh, pray that. Yeah, that's your pastor, all right. The mighty artist. And so praise the Lord. Seven uh, churches and uh, praise the Lord. Seven churches seven truths. And say that with me. Seven churches, seven truths. And praise the Lord, we have the uh, Black Sea right here, and we go down over here, and oh, it's a beautiful map right here. We have uh, the, uh, I didn't draw that over far enough right here, Macedonia, Archaea, and uh, yeah. Uh, 
We have a very merciful church, I can see. Uh, this is the Nile River, the Red Sea, the Dead Sea, Sea of uh, Galilee, and the Jordan River. Uh, over here would be the city of Antioch, where they sent out the, uh, the missionaries, Paul and Barnabas. Over here, you have Ephesus. Ephesus is on the sea coast right there. Then we go to Smyrna, and then Pergamos, and then I think it's uh, is it Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia and Laodicea. Philadelphia and Laodicea, this is considered the Asia Minor. And so the seven churches were written right here. If you remember, as we're writing this, that John was, Sister Gray, that is not very nice laughing at my picture right there. It's a nice picture. And, uh, but praise the Lord, we look at these seven churches right here. Ephesus, John was at the church there in Ephesus. And uh, we see that he had been a part of this church in Ephesus. He was exiled to the island of Patmos, which is a little island out over here in the, the Mediterranean Sea. And we see that seven churches, seven truths right here. These are literal churches. These are actual churches that had been planted, churches. Uh, full, filled with people who had been saved, people who had been baptized by immersion, people that were gathering together, uh, listening to the Word of God, studying the Word of God, living the Word of God. That's what a church is. It's a, a group of people who had been saved, a group of people that had been baptized, a group of people that are gathering together under the preaching of God's Word, trying to live out the Word of God. And that's important. It's not a building. It's a group of people. And these uh, churches were filled with people that are imperfect, just like you and me, uh, sinners saved by God's grace, uh, people that are trying to live for the Lord, but often there are problems in the church because the church is made up of sinners, and sinners have problems. Let's go over, if you will, to chapter 2, if you will, and we're going to start with uh, this wonderful first church, the church that is called the Church of Ephesus. And uh, praise the Lord. We look at this uh, church at Ephesus. I am getting lost in my notes. But you're, you're okay with that, right? What's that? We have plenty. Thank you, Brother Pete. I appreciate that. And so, oh, here we go. Uh, just give me a second here. I think you're making me nervous tonight. I'm missing a page. Whew. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse number 1. And it says, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who work, uh, walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are what? And are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and hast not fainted. Look at verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And then look at this first word of verse number 5. What does it say? Remember, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. And I want to look at that first truth. And the first truth that I'll put over there in Church of Ephesus is to remember. Say that with me. Remember. And that word remember, uh, think back. And you think about the word remember. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Psalm chapter 89. Remember how short my time is. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. The word remember, sometimes we forget. Sometimes we forget. Uh, my children's name, my children's birthdays, uh, my children. I'll look at Dan, I'll say, Joshua, Joshua, wake up, Joshua. I'm not Joshua, Dad, I'm Dan. And that happens far too often. I forget names. And I had one of uh, my, my sons uh, come up to me the other day, and we were talking. He talked about me loaning him money, and I didn't remember me loaning him any money, and, uh, which is funny. He said, Dad, I, I uh, borrowed a certain amount of money. I said, did you really? I think back, I sort of, but I had a hard time remembering it. Sometimes our memory is not as good as we'd like. This church had some good things. They'd left their first love, but it was important for them to remember, remember. I truly have forgotten some things. Uh, Pastor, uh, my best, well, uh, 
pastor called, acted like, oh yeah, pastor called me a few weeks ago, and I was on the phone with him, he acted like I was his best buddy, and uh, he said his name, and I didn't remember him at all. And uh, the sad thing is all of a sudden after I got off the phone, I started thinking back and after a while all of a sudden it dawned on me who he was. That's bad sometimes. But do we ever forget? And this church is saying to remember. Remember, the Ephesian church was to remember. Remember. And, and you think about it. For us, I thought about we ought to remember our creator. We forget. Sometimes we get so busy that we forget that God created the heaven and the earth. And I think that word right there causes us to think about, remember, is there something you have forgotten in your life? Remember when you were saved. Sometimes it's been so long that you've been saved that you can't even remember the, the gift of eternal life. When were you saved? Remember the power in this book. Sometimes we forget the power that is in the book. Remember to tell people about Jesus. Boy, remember when you used to pass out tracts. Remember when you used to tell people about Jesus. And it's saying, hey, go back and remember those things. Don't forget, you've gotten so busy with many other things, you've got to stop and remember. Hey, remember the importance of church. Remember that we're on the winning side. And I, I really think the one truth right here is to remember, 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 remember. Take some time. And remember, think about those things. And if we spent time thinking about the important things that this church at Ephesus right there would stop, and they left their first love, and it almost seems that they left their first love because they forgot about it. They forgot about it. They, they didn't remember. And he's saying, hey, remember those things right there. Amen. Continue on, if you will. Let's go on a little bit further to verse number eight. These are seven churches, seven truths. And uh, I like this one. If you look at verse eight, it says, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, right, uh, right. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And then verse nine, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of, blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Verse 10, fear, fear what? Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The second one I put is fear, um, fear, fear none. Fear, that word fear none. This church was going to go through a lot of difficulties and struggles. There was going to be some of the people that are going to be cast into prison. And it's saying fear none. Fear not. Fear, in other words, the fear of man bringeth a snare. And there's a correlation there between a difference between the fear of man and the fear of God. And it was saying to the church, in other words, don't fear man. Don't fear what man can do unto you. Don't fear the jail cell. Don't fear even Satan, but fear the Almighty God. And it's an important thought right there. Fear none. Fear not. The fear of man bringeth a snore, but the fear of the Lord... Uh, praise God. Uh, fear of the Lord is absolutely wonderful. Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 4, talks about Jehoshaphat when he was king. And he says he brought them back unto the Lord, God of their fathers. And then he laid out these judges in the land. He was trying to bring the nation back to God, Jehoshaphat was. And he said to the judges, Take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord. Wherefore, now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. He looked at these judges, and this is a story from the Chronicles. Jehoshaphat, he said to the, the judges, he said, I'm going to send you back to this land. We're taking this land back for God. Uh, we're going to do something with this land. This is God's land. This is God's country. And what I want you to do is go, and you're going to take charge and lead that section of the, uh, of the nation back to God. But don't fear man, fear God. And that, that's important. Here at the, the second church, it was uh, don't fear man, but fear God. Don't worry necessarily about the, uh, the prison cell. Smyrna, fear none. All right, some of you, uh, Smyrna, fear none. I'll put that up there, fear none. This is a great truth uh, because often we have such a fear of man. The fear of man bringeth snare. Uh, you continue on that thought. Uh, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is clean. Come, ye children, hearken to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. It can be taught. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. You choose whether you fear the Lord or not. Thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy in the evil way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord prolongeth day. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. 
The fear of the Lord. Listen, in that church right there, they did some things that were upsetting the community. And all of a sudden, there was going to come in there people and cast those people into prison. They were going to suffer persecution. All that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Well, if I tell people about Jesus, I'll lose my job. You have a fear of losing your job. Uh, well, if I go out and knock on somebody's door, they may not understand. They might slam the door in my face. You have a fear of man and what they do unto you. Uh, I fear my parents because uh, I'm going to tell them that I got saved, and I'm going to go over there, I'm going to tell them that I got glorious to save. They'll shun me. And you think about this church, some of the Jewish people that had gotten saved, they were going to be shunned by their parents. They had a fear of them. He's saying, don't worry about all that. Don't worry about it. Have a fear of God. Fear none. And that is a vital truth right there in those seven truths that I was speaking of. Don't fear a man. Fear God. I was in the, the Navy, and boy, I'd just gotten saved, and I got on my boat, and I began a Bible study. Nobody else would start one. And, and I remember I, I began to go out and witness to people. I gathered people together for a Bible study, and boy, we had a rousing Bible study. I remember we had about 15 people there. And man, I was witnessing to people. It, I was excited, but I didn't know what I was doing. Then there was about five people who had been saved previous to that that were more learned than me, uh, had been in church longer than me. And after one of the Bible says, said, we need to meet with you. And there was a chief, there was a first class, there were uh, people that are higher rank than me. And they brought me into this office and they gathered around me and said, we don't like the way you're doing the Bible study. And, and I remember, I, I was shocked. There were people getting saved. God was doing something there. And they said, if you keep on doing what you're doing, we're not going to come. And they put a lot of pressure on me. And I remember I went out and to the outside of the ship late one night after that happened. And I cried out to God. I was in tears. And, and I was, you know, tempted in some ways to stop what I was doing. I was tempted in some ways to quit telling people to come to a Bible study or even having it. I was discouraged. Have you ever been discouraged? Boy, people discourage you. And we began to have an inside feeling, feeling of anxiety. But then God made it very clear to me that the ship needed a gospel witness. They needed a place for people to go to hear the word of God while we were on deployment. And it's interesting, hindsight's always 2020. I can look back now, and one of my friends that came to that Bible study is Jim Davidson, who's a pastor down in North Carolina. Amen. And God used that in a mighty, mighty way. And you think about that, the, the devil wants you to stop in dead in your tracks, quit going to church, tr trying to do anything for, for the Lord and have a fear of man. And he's saying to this church, fear none. Don't fear that. Don't worry about that. Go to Pergamos, which is chapter 2, verse 12. That's a great truth. Encourage if you have a concordance or something, look, look up fear, uh, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord throughout the Bible. And uh, praise the Lord. I, I should have stopped because you, you got to, to Acts chapter uh, 9. Then, the, the, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking. These churches were walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. That's a fantastic truth. A church walking in the fear of the Lord. It doesn't matter what the world's doing. We have a fear for God, fear of God. We, we see who he is. He's the king of kings and Lord of lords. We as a church walking down, bowing our head to God, not man, but God. Go, like I said, to the church of Pergamos, verse number 12, chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, uh, which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou hold, holdest, look at that, that term, thou holdest fast my name. Thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. And, and it seemed like in that city of Pergamos, uh, there was Satan's seat. It was an idol, and it was well known. It seems like people went there, and they worshipped different gods other than the real God. And these people had a love, and the way it says it, they, they, thou holdest fast my name. And so with Pergamos, the name of Jesus. Amen. The name of Jesus. And I was thinking about the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. You know, it, people don't mind when you pray, just don't pray in Jesus' name. They don't mind if you have a bumper sticker on the back of your car or van, but just don't put the name of Jesus on there. Uh, they don't mind you talking about your religion, but just don't say the name of Jesus. And we think about the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. 
uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Don't you just love the name Jesus? Amen. The name of Jesus. Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Acts chapter 4, verse 18. And they called them and commanded them, commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. And had, had called the apostles and beaten them and commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Uh, by the way, Acts chapter 5, verse 41, they were uh, they re rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And you can continue on. Acts chapter 9, he spake boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Amen. And we think about that. Every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Christ. Many people try to diminish Jesus, say he's not God, but he's God. That's right. And we're going to bow to him, worship him. And they were and there, they were the name of Jesus. They were holding fast to that name. They were clinging to the, the name. And you know, all religions lead to the same place. No, they don't. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And we think about it, there's such a, a different thought process out there. Well, it's Jesus plus your works. No, it's Jesus and Jesus alone. Cling, hold fast to Jesus and Jesus alone. It's an important truth. It seems minor, but it's not. It's major. Jesus is the Bible. Jesus is the Word of God. And the name of Jesus, let's hold on to the name of Jesus. And they were saying to him, hey, hold the name of Jesus right there. Hold it fast. You're doing right with that. Don't give up the name of Jesus. Proclaim his name. Live for his name. Uh, share his name. And a church ought to be all about Jesus. Continue on, if you will. And we'll go over to uh, chapter 2, verse 18, Thyatira. Thyatira, verse 18. It says, Under the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now, go over to verse number 20. Go a little bit further. Look at this. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then they commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, now look at this phrase, and which have not known, not known the depths of Satan. The depths of Satan. Now, I thought that phrase was astounding, the depths of Satan. And uh, you think about the depths of Satan. The depths of Satan. <laughs> Holy moly. Uh, you, and it was speaking about people that hadn't not known the depths of Satan. Uh, young folks who have not gone into sin, praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord that you don't know how wicked it is out in this world. Amen. It's bad. Yes, uh, you have purity of heart and mind. You're not perfect, but you don't know the depths of Satan. And you haven't been, uh, you might say, uh, scarred by the wickedness of this world. But many of you in here have been. And you know how bad it is. You have seen the depths of Satan. And you know the, the phrase that sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you, you want to pay. That's a good term. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And, and it's important. You know, sin, Galatians chapter 5, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresy, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And by the way, you've heard it once. You've heard it before. How did, how did this happen to me? How did I get here? Have you been there? How did this happen to me? The depths of Satan. And we think about the depths going deep and low into sin. 
And uh, wow, when I was a kid, I grew up going to church as a kid. About 12 years old, my dad quit going to church. And uh, next thing you know, I still had those moral values, and, uh, but got into high school, and my mom told me, be careful who you hang around. And I, did, I, I believed that, but I didn't understand the depths of Satan. And I began to hang around a, a fellow who was a thief. I'd never steal. Not me. Until I did. And boy, I remember, I, I put it on my notes, the worst day of my entire life. The worst day of my entire life, my grandpa Steinhoff's birthday. And uh, there I told my mom and dad, I'll, I'll meet you down in Denver, Colorado. I'll, I'll meet you down at grandpa's house. And I remember going, and the whole purpose I did was going to different stores to what we called gank or steal. And, and it was terrible. And it was rotten. And I remember going into a certain store, and uh, I went in there, and I stole. And I was walking out, and they said, stop. And I didn't stop. I ran. And they came after me and chasing me through a parking lot, and they dived, dove on me, crushed me. And uh, they took me back there. They called the Denver police, and the police called my dad. They called over my grandpa's house. And uh, my dad says, throw him into jail. That's what my dad said, rightfully so. And, and I remember that. They eventually let me go. But imagine me. Boy, I had to uh, be like a dog with my tail tucked between my legs going over to my grandpa's house, embarrassed my whole family. Such an embarrassing. And I thought, how did this ever happen to me? How did I find out the depths of Satan? By the way, there's maybe lower lows, probably. But for me, that, I look back and it drugged me low. And boy, it, it crushed me at that period of time. And it broke me. And it hurt me. And it scarred me. And by the way, the scars still remain. There's still some uh, thoughts. And it's funny. Uh, you look at me as a pastor, but the store that I, I stole from was Kmart. I never go into Kmart the same way. I'm, I'm serious. I, I don't walk out of there. If I ever go into Kmart, I, I walk in, I think about walking out of there, and I remember that, and it's a scarf. And I, and I always have a tendency to be very careful because I think somebody's going to think that I'm stealing. There's scars of sin. And all of us realize that in so many different aspects. And he's saying, hey, be careful of the depths of Satan right there. You haven't gone that far. By the way, young people, boy, your mom and dad are right. Stay pure. Stay right. Stay faithful. You're not missing out. You're blessed by not going into the depths of Satan. You're not missing out at all. You don't want to be scarred. The scars, they hurt. Uh, they're real. and they're, they're atrocious. And boy, if it sounds like I'm bragging about sin, no, I'm not. I'm warning you. It's terrible. It's wicked. It's rotten. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. And you keep yourself from that junk. Be careful of the depths of Satan. Go on, if you will. Uh, I like this. This is a, an interest. Sardis, verse number one of chapter three. We've got three more. Paul, oh, the angel of the church in Sardis write. Go to verse 2. Be watchful and strength. Oh, last part of verse 1. It says that thou hast a name, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art, what? Dead. Thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. And I put this, this one's thou livest and art dead. That's a phrase. Thou livest and art dead. When you're living for yourself, you're living but you're dead. When you're living for money, you're living, but really you're dead. When you're living for fame, you're living, but you're dead. When you're living for pleasure, you're living, but you're dead. When you're living for work or a legacy or for sports or for education, you're living, but you're dead. Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ. And so listen, we don't want to walk around as dead people, living, but dead. You've only got one chance to live. And I quoted that sermon on, or that man on Sunday uh, J Oswald J. Smith, and he was a young person. He uh, riding his mule, and he's praying to God, Lord, I've only got one life to live. Let me live for you. Let me live for you. Let me live for you. I don't want to live a life that's worthless. A life is but a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Listen, your children, they're only in your house for a short period of time. They grow up. You've only got one chance to raise your kids for the Lord. Your marriage, boy, don't take your marriage for granted. God gave you a, your wife or your husband. Boy, I understand that you don't be dead while you're living. Don't take for granted your marriage. Don't take for granted a good church. Amen. But we got a good church. Uh, imperfect people, yes, but man, we got a good church. Don't take for granted your church. Say, praise God for giving me a good church to be a part of. But take your life, that, that song that we sang earlier, and uh, it, it was entitled... Um, must I go on empty handed? I listen to that thing. I, I don't want to sing it to you, but it, it's, well, maybe I will. <laughs> 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 
Now I'm going to sing it, Jay. You're making fun of my singing. But it mu <laughs> must I go and empty handed, thus my Redeemer to meet. Not one day of service give him, lay no trophy at his feet. I didn't sing the words, but I, I, when I heard that, listen, I, I cried today. Because I, I want to get up to the Lord and have lived for him. And it's so easy, sin can grip a hold of your life, my life, just like that. And we can, we can go into to heaven empty-handed. It's just sad. It's sad because he did so much for you. He did so much for me, did he not? And I don't want to be living but dead. I want to be alive and living for the Lord. I want to be alive and living for the Lord. Must I go and empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so, so not one soul with which to greet him? Must I empty-handed go? Not at death I shrink or falter. For my Savior saves me now. I'm not scared of dying. I'm going to heaven. But to meet him empty-handed, uh, thought of that now clouds my brow. Oh, the years in sinning wasted. Oh, the years in sinning wasted. Oh, the years in sinning wasted. Could I but recall them now? I would give them to my Savior, to his will I'd gladly bow. Oh, ye saints, arouse, be earnest, up and work while yet tis day. Ere the night of death or take thee, strive for souls. Strive for souls. Hey, church, Grace Baptist Temple, strive for souls while still you may. Two more. And I'll just, Church of Philadelphia is the church of the open door. And I thought about that. We have an open door. Think about a church, an open door. And people will put all these churches in a line and say their time periods and I, I sort of like that thought sometimes. I like the last two. Philadelphia uh, seems like the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, and then the Laodiceans seems like the, the church where they're lukewarm. And the, the thing, it's not here nor there. That doesn't even matter. We'll find out when we get to heaven. But the message there about being an op having an open door, truthfully, you have an open door. You have an open door with your life to do something for God. And too often we make excuses. We, we, it's not that the door is not open. It's, it's open, but we close it ourselves. Or we don't walk through. And listen, there's so many opportunities you have to serve and live for the Lord. That open door, run through the open doors God gives you. A gospel track, give them out. Uh, an opportunity to go soul winning, go soul winning. Amen. Amen. An opportunity to go soul winning, go soul winning. Amen. An opportunity to witness somebody, tell them about Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. And listen, so often we don't know. And then the last one is the lukewarm Christianity. And we'll finish with that. It's uh, the Laodicean church. That's Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse 14. Another, the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. Verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So that because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And my Nehemiah, he uh, the other day, I had a cup of coffee, and I, I was warming his hands with a cup of coffee, hot cup of coffee, and uh, it was steaming hot, and he was fine. He was cold, hand cold or cold, but a little bit later, I took over, and it cooled down. He didn't realize it was lukewarm. I was going to give him a drink of my coffee, and he looked like he was, he was scared of it. It was hot, and, and we think about that. The, the, the other day, we were eating those uh, pizza rolls, and we had some lukewarm pizza rolls. They were good. And then all of a sudden, some came out of the oven. I forgot that they were hot, and I put them in my mouth. And <laughs> hot. And we know there's a difference between cold and hot. Amen. But lukewarm Christianity makes God sick. It makes them want to spew you out of their mouth. And the problem seems with we have a lot of lukewarm Christians. It's interesting. Let me tell you a story. I know it's a little bit later, and we'll, we'll survive. Amen. An extra five minutes, we'll, we'll be okay. Um, I, I read. I like to read about the past. I like to read about churches and, you know, churches 50 years ago. There was sin in churches, but it seems like a lot, a lot of the pastors weren't so sidetracked. They talked about reading the Bible and witnessing and doing uh, things for God. You read about Bible colleges. The Bible colleges, they were people that were on fire for God, trying to win souls. By the way, in our area, we used to have independent Baptist churches that ran over 1,000. Lots of them, actually. And that, that's today, the, probably the largest independent Baptist in our ch church in our area runs 350, maybe 400 on a, lucky, on a big day. Maybe. Maybe. That's sad. It's sad. It's not because God is dead. Amen. 
and it said, you know, and I think in some ways we're lukewarm, we don't even know it. Just follow with me for a second. We're lukewarm and we don't even know it. Uh, reading the Bible. Boy, I'm proud of you for reading the Bible. That ought to be normal. Had a, a college group come stay at my house from a Bible college. Uh, probably, quote unquote, one of the leading Bible colleges in all of America. Stay at my house. And five young guys stayed there. And so I had to do with all of my spent time with them and we had him stay over as a friend to, to Brother Galleon's daughter, uh, works at that college, and so we had them stay at our house as a favor for them. So I talked to them, and, and I asked them, so how, how do you guys, you guys uh, been reading your Bible lately? Did you read the Bible last year? Did you read it through? And the one guy said, oh, uh, no, I'm, I'm really busy. And then so I went to all of them, and come to find out, the oldest, the leader's 24, he's never read his Bible through, ever. And he said, I, I get stuck in Leviticus. And he says, I, I just, he says, I'll get up in the morning and I'll read a verse and that's good enough for me, is basically what he said. And I'm not trying to be critical, but it's Bible college. <laughs> Bible college. This is our future. Uh, that's not, it's not you, it's not me, it's our future. And it was just pitiful. The combined five of them had read the Bible through three or four times ever in their lives. I'm not trying to be mean. So I asked him, so have you read any history books, like any biographies? And the guy said, biographies? Well, I've read, uh, like, Brett Favre's biography. It's a football player. So were you ever reading about I just don't, I just don't read too much. I don't, I don't really have time for it. And, and you know, the, it was pitiful. Two of the three, uh, two of the, the five didn't get up till 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm not, I'm, try, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying that you, you want to talk about a lukewarm Christianity, we're in trouble. If that's our hope, and probably a lot of it is they haven't been taught. <clears throat> Don't talk. If you're going to be in Bible college, you're going to start a church or be an evangelist, you better read your Bible. <laughs> Not because you have to. I mean, the guy sounded like it was torture having to read the Bible. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to criticize. I'm just saying it's pitiful. You know, and the same thing is pitiful for us. We're just as pitiful. Oh, that pastor is preaching past 8.15. How dare he preach a long sermon? No, and I'm saying sometimes we get that way. I've got to go home. I've got to do this. I've got, we don't have time for that. You know, I can't believe pastor would want me to go to Wednesday night service or Sunday night service. We're weak. We're lukewarm. And that's why we're dying as, as, as a church. Not because we don't have a great God. We have a great God. I asked the guy, I said, okay, so who's your favorite preacher? Uh, and th they all named some new preachers, and I said, do you know any of the preachers of the past? What's your favorite preacher of the past? Uh, do you know any Baptist preachers of the past? Um, Billy Graham. And that may not mean anything to you, but if you're a Bible college student, hope, hopefully you know a little bit about Billy Graham, and is shacking up with uh, Catholics, his ecumenicalism, it's bad. And I'm not saying he never preached a good sermon, he probably did, but if that's your favorite preacher and the person you're following, you're in trouble. So then I asked the guys, I said, well, what about uh, preachers from the past. I asked one guy specifically. I had a two-hour conversation with him. I said, what about pre He says, well, they don't really speak to me. They can't relate to me. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, these new guys relate to me. And they named this guy named Judah Smith. Not even a Baptist. Then he named this other guy, uh, Greg Lowry. Not even a Baptist. And it was pitiful. It was pitiful. And, uh, you know, I don't have much time with him. I was nice to them and kind to them. But I did throw a curveball at them. I did. And, and I didn't rebuke them a little bit. I said, listen, you guys, our future, hope, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You need to get in your Bible. You need to read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Bible college. That may be hard, but it's true. And, and then all of a sudden, by the way, can I, can I say that if you're right with God, you're reading the Bible, you like this preaching. You do. Lukewarm people don't. They don't because they're full of the flesh. But if, if we're going to read and say amen to lukewarm Christianity, let's, let's not be lukewarm. Let's be on fire for God. Let's have some moms and dads that have some fire for God. Let's have some old people that have some fire for God. Let's have some young people that have some fire for God. You know, that wake up. By the way, I'm so proud of you. That's probably 45 people that have read the New Testament so far this, as a church. I'm proud of you. That's fire.
It's a challenge. That's good. But have a fire for God. Let's not be lukewarm. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, 